Hey guys, so um, this is unri Unrighteous and Sanctified. Can you be both? Lesson four, let's go. Um, we have explored what sanctification is and what righteous living looks like, but there is this pesky problem of the modern church in which many people claim that they're Christians, but um, clearly the fruits that they have seem to be more of what would be characterized as unsanctified or defiled. So we need to dig into this a little bit and just to make sure like are, are people who are living like this, are they okay with their um, salvation? So Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the glory of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, Many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he went wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Now again, the Bible points out that holiness is mandatory. And to be able to be in the Lord's presence, we've already established that we have to be holy. So that we do what the text says and look carefully, um, we don't fall short of the glory of the grace of God. Let us explore a few, few scriptures. They break down what holiness looks like and what things are deemed as unholy and unrepairable or what things are deemed as repairable and how to do so. So let's start by acknowledging that the Bible addresses various groups of people, okay? So every verse is not for you right this second in your life. You know, every verse, some verses are talking about people that are not saved. Some verses are talking about the saved. Some people are, some verses are talking to uh, people that are saved, but they're maybe on, you know, shaky ground, okay? So um, I'm going to clarify here just, just for the basics of um, definitions so we can talk to different groups of people wherever you might land in that group so that you can understand how you can get re-justified or readjusted to Christ and to God in case you have been um, wrongfully doing something and maybe you didn't even know you were okay all humanity there's the justified this person is saved they live under grace by choosing Christ they walk in the Holy Spirit they're free from the bondage of sin they will have eternal life with righteous living, justification, and holiness. Then there's sinful man. He is unsaved. He lives under law by default. He lives under a spirit of bondage to sin. He has enmity toward God. And he will have eternal damnation unless he becomes saved. Okay, so those are your two basic categories in life. There's like the saved person, the unsaved person. So what gets tricky is what happens with the people that when any of these people sin, what, how do you justify and get those things right, okay? So a justified person sinning looks like this. He's saved, he unknowingly slips into a sin. The Holy Spirit convicts him via the Bible, another Christian or sermon. He's like, oh dear. He might even just feel it in his heart. He's like, oh, I shouldn't have done that, okay? The man is remorseful. He prays to stop doing whatever that wrong thing was. He has never lost his justified status with God. He is learning to become more righteous every day. He will have eternal life with continued righteous living and justification of holiness. So a justified man does a sin. He feels that twinge that he shouldn't have done it. He asks for forgiveness and he's fine. Everything's good. A justified person does not lose their justified status. Okay. Then we've got the Christianish sinful person. This person appears to be saved. They speak Jesus, they attend church, they live like the defiled world, they support the world's beliefs, methods, philosophies, all of it over the Bible. So if, if the world disagrees with the Bible, they agree with the world. They don't agree with the Bible. They are not saved. They will have eternal damnation unless they become saved. So no matter what they do as a sin, it's just considered sinful man. You have to be saved in order to get rid of those sins, okay? Justified man never changes his justification status, okay? Unless, here's a category. 
There's the sinning justified man, okay? The sinning justified man, um, he is saved. He knowingly sins. Then the Holy Spirit convicts him of this sin via the Bible, another Christian, or a sermon. The man will not listen. He continues in his defilement and his unrighteousness. In his sin, he spirals, spirals deeper and deeper into unrighteousness until he denies Christianity either verbally or by worshiping idols or by choosing willfully to go under the law and deny grace. Um, he will have eternal damnation for rejecting God. Now, as a caveat, this person could stop at any point in this process and turn around and submit to God, okay? But because they do not stop and they continue to sin, then at some point they finally reject God, they will not be saved, okay? So what kind of sin is it, all right? Now, the thing we've been told all of our lives if we've been attending church is, oh, all sin is sin. It's all, it's all the same. So if you murder someone or if you say a cuss word or if you um, rob a bank, it's all the sin is sin to God and you know it's just a bad thing and you have to be forgiven and, and you're good, okay? Uh, that's just not real. That's, that's absolutely not what the Bible says, okay? If you read through the Old Testament, they have variances of sins and certain sins take different kind of sacrifices. So clearly God has a uh, system where he has a hierarchy. Certain sins are way worse than other sins, okay? But in the New Testament, that's what we're under and that's where we that's where we get our bread and butter. So we have to say, okay, what does the New Testament say about that, okay? So um, there are degrees of sin and there are capital sins worthy of death. And then there are other sins that are sins of ignorance, okay? Which have a level of defilement. The person might be defiled, but God takes those persons and those sins based on the person's motivation, their heart, okay? If they're doing it in rebellion, or if they're doing it in um, a point, as a point of like, oh, I, I didn't even know that you couldn't do that, you know? On some level, every divergence is sin, right? And yes, all, all sin is unrighteousness. But on another level, the level we're talking about on how to get back into a happy status with God, um, those, those, there are variances of degrees, okay? So 1 John 5, 16 to 18, if anyone sees his brother sinning, remember brother, he's already a Christian, okay? If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, which does not lead to death, that means there is one that leads to death, right? Which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. All right, so that means there is sin, there is variance to God, that there are sins that lead to death and sins that don't lead to death. So we better figure this out. Let's break down the Greek, the brother. Um, a member of the same religious community, a fellow Christian. That's very specific. It's a brother sinning. He's sinning to miss the mark, to commit offense against God. All actions done apart from faith. Sin is an ethical failure, a sinful deed, missing the mark. Anything you do that is not originated from God anything that is self-empowered or anything that is not of faith is considered sin. So that some sins do not lead to death. That means not moving toward the goal or destination of the spiritual and physical death. Okay, so certain sins will not take you to hell, okay? Certain sins can be forgiven should you do them on your path. They don't take you to hell instantly. It's not like, do not pass go, do not collect $200 to go straight to hell. That That's not the kind of sin that that is, okay? Then it says, all unrighteousness is sin. So anything in the unrighteous category, so these all come from the heart and soul. They're opposite of justice. They're a violation of God's standards that bring divine disapproval, iniquities, wrongdoings, 
wickedness which all carry the guilt and penalty due. We know whoever is born of God, so that means to be born of a father, to bring forth a child, to regenerate. That means everyone who has been baptized and regenerated by the Holy Spirit, okay, born of, that's what that means. Anyone who has been regenerated by the Spirit does not sin, okay? Not sin means cannot, impossible, cannot, it's unable to. And it says unable to continue to sin. That doesn't mean you never slip up. It means you probably won't slip up on the same stuff over and over and over and over and over. And it cannot sin. That means to miss the mark and miss God's standard for an eternal loss. Meaning you will not sin and continue to sin that brings you to the point of going to hell. Okay. He who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not um, touch him. So to keep himself is to protect, to maintain, to spiritually guard, to observe or watch over. Meaning your responsibility is to be introspective and be like, okay, do I measure up? When I read the Bible, do I do, I do these things in this verse? Okay, that's the goal. Um, I have here a thing of vocabulary that you can screenshot. I'm not gonna read through it, but it's kind of interesting. The opposites, these are opposite words. So like sin means not honoring God. I don't think most people think that. Unclean, the opposite of that is um, consecrated. You know, stuff like this, illusion. So here we have this really cool chart that I made and I took all these verses that I'll flash on the screen. And from these verses, I could see clearly that there's a hierarchy and a um, actual definition of how God sees sin, okay? so. Under law, by default, is everything on this list, okay? So if you want to be under grace, you should not be doing anything on this list, okay? This is all sinful. This is all negative um, behaviors, okay? But it starts at the top. So sin, okay? That is not fearing God, lawlessness, and offense, or to miss the mark. But that overlaps with grave sin, which is making of gods of gold, that's a grave sin. Go to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Off you go. Okay. Then, and that's of people who know better. Okay. So if you did that and then you've never um, come to Christ, then you come to Christ and you realize that you worshiping an idol was wrong or you made gods that were false. They were wrong. That is a fresh start and you don't have to worry about ever. But if you knew better and you knew you could not worship false gods and then you decide, you know, I'm going to try it. That is like a go to hell, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Then we've got this overlaps. Both of those overlap with the exchanging truth for a lie, worshiping the created, not worshiping the creator. Now in this gray rectangle, this is all unrighteous and ungodly behavior. We've got suppressing the truth, not glorifying God, not thankful to God. We've got the lust of flesh and dishonoring of bodies. We have futile in thoughts, foolish hearts, darkened hearts, create idols, idol worship, darkened understanding, envy, pride, foolishness, and murder is defiled and unrighteous and ungodly. Okay. Um, then we have on the left, ungodly things, which are alienated from the life of God. We have unrighteous things which are serving the created, not the creator, vile passionism, haters of God, morality, violent, boasting, not retaining God in one's knowledge, strife, evil-minded, whisperer, deceit, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, unloving, undiscerning, unmerciful, unforgiving, overflowing with wickedness, those who do these things, those who approve of those who do these things. Now this overlaps, you can see down here, there's walking in the flesh and that overlaps so there's certain activities that overlap with walking in the flesh that um, overlap with all these other things changing the colors. Now, on unrighteousness that overlaps with defiled is drunkard, covet, theft, and fornication. Unrighteousness that overlaps with walking in the flesh is adultery, reviler, and filthiness. So then defiled, which we do have at the top with unrighteous and ungodly, but it's such a massive thing for its own and where it overlaps with um, walking in the flesh, I had to make a second defiled. So complainers walking after their own lust, an evil eye speaking evil of dignitaries, blasphemy, corrupt selves in the natural, 
false witness, filthy dreamers, in the way of Cain, brute beasts, despised dominion, run after the error of Balaam, same rebellion of Korah, speak great swelling words, admired by men because of profit. Now where it overlaps with walking in the flesh is evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, lewdness, and deceit. And then walking in the flesh itself. This is where walking in the flesh and defiled is where a lot of Christians get um, mixed up. They're like, I do these things, okay? So I must be, you know, sinning or whatever. This is where it comes into, is that thought leading your life? Is this how you're trying to do your life? Or is this an oopsie? I need to fix this and not go there anymore, okay? Portioner, outburst of wrath, sorcery, self-ambition, hatred, dissension, contentions, heresy, jealousy, foolish talk, coarse jesting, evil speak, bitterness, deceitful lust, clamor, malice, corruptions, deceitful plotting, greedy, cunning craftiness, futility of mind, tossed to and fro with all kinds of doctrine. The consequences of these things, the error is penalty due, wrath revealed versus them, um, deserving death, reaps corruption, unfruitful works of darkness, or destruction, not inherit the kingdom of God and God will destroy. Now these activities, sometimes Christians have an overlap. You know, there are Christians who perform adultery. There are Christians who complain. There are some activities in each of these that someone might do that they did not realize were wrong. And we're gonna discuss how to get out of the pit, okay? The sinner is bound by sin. As you can see, the justified person that is true to the Lord feels remorse for their sin and they no longer wish to sin. The poser is tricky because he has a chameleon spirit that makes him appear as a Christian, but his actions show him as an unjustified person, which makes him in the category of sin. But then we have this character who is a traitor and they willfully switch teams. This appears to be contrary to scripture because in one scripture it might say, oh, you're saved forever and you could never lose your salvation. And then in another um, scripture, it'll say, if you do this, you're going to hell, right? So I'm gonna break down a couple of those verses and define and see why these make sense, okay? So sinful person is Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin are death. Romans 6.22 is about the sinning justified man. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the fruit you reap leads to holiness and the outcome is eternal life. Then the Christian-ish sinful person is um, Titus 1.16, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works, they deny him being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Hebrews 6.4, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the ages to come, if they fall away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So I'm going to deal with each of these groups and how to get them into right standing so there's no confusion and depending on wherever you sit or someone you might be praying for sits. No one, no misunderstandings. Okay. The sinful man who is walking in the flesh is bound by sin. He need only to realize that he is lesser. God is holy and that God made the universe. He knows how to make it function. He knows how we will function best. He needs to understand that he is trapped in sin without accepting God's grace. If he accepts God's grace and believes fully in his heart that Jesus is the propitiation for all of our sins and that he can be saved, all he has to do is become obedient man, do all the things that are hearing, believing, um, being remorseful for his sins, confessing that Christ is real, get baptized, let the Holy Spirit regenerate him. Then he starts the path of righteous living, which creates the fruit of holiness, which creates holy living, and he can go to heaven. And all of his sins will be erased. Everything he did in the past, everything he will do as he is in the process of learning how to become righteous okay that's the basic story of how you get from sinner to be able to access god then we've got um the justified okay the justified man that slips into error um most likely without a willful cause they're not trying to go and do something horrible on accident of some sort they have found themselves out 
of the narrow path. They're like, oh, how did I get here? What's going on? Or, or they learn something. They're reading the Bible and they're like, oh, I didn't realize we weren't allowed to do that. Or um, they're with some people and they're kind of feel like manipulated into a situation and they don't choose the right thing that time. They really should have cho chose Christ, but they were like, uh, I'm not ready. I don't know how to do this yet. Okay. So this person makes a mistake. Here's the big difference between them and the traitor. What they do is they feel bad. They go to Christ. They say, I'm sorry. Help me fix this. Help me not to do this anymore. They ask the Holy Spirit for power to overcome. So this person, rest assured, 99% of Christians are in this position right here. Okay. They're trying their best to be their best. And they have different hurdles and they have different things that happen in their life they weren't prepared for. Something happened that shocked them and they fell back into an old behavior. But they're still seeking and striving after Christ's likeness, even though something might have tripped them up. This is a verse that helps support that, okay? First John 3, 2 to 9, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him, that means you're walking in Christ, whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you that he who practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this is the purpose of the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for he, his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Okay, so let's look at these verses. He has this hope. What does that mean? He's been regenerated and he's saved. He who has this hope in him purifies himself. Purifies means cleanse ceremonially or morally from defilement to take upon oneself purification. This is used of the Nazarites who would take upon themselves a temporary lifetime vow as to make a promise to God to be set apart, okay? So this is a willful setting apart where you're making a choice. So this, this person is purifying themselves. They have chosen to be set apart for Christ. They're not bumbling along just like going to church and then partying every other day. Whoever commits sin. So this is to manufacture, to form or fashion, to exercise, to be the author and the cause of. So the difference between this is the person who is manufacturing sin or actually becoming, they're like seeking after it. They're going and they're like, you know, it'd be great. <laughs> and they're being evil, right? Those two people can't exist in the same sentence, okay? Because if you're trying to be set apart for Christ, there's no possibility you can be like, you know, the best way to steal money, you just, you just can't do it. So this person who originates this way to make sin, okay, which is that whole anything not made of faith, everything that is self-empowered, and everything that is missing the mark according to God's rules, um, is lawless. What is lawless? This is iniquity, utter disregard for God's laws. So this person doesn't care what the law of God is. They're not even trying. Do you see how they can't be on the same path? It says, whoever abides in him, who is him? God. Whoever abides in God, which means to stay or remain, to endure, to stay and tarry as a guest, does not sin. What does this mean? Unable to continue to sin. It doesn't mean you never have a mistake. It means you don't continue on in the mistake. You, you feel bad, you repent, you stop doing it, you change your habits. Okay. He who practices righteousness. This is the same word as the person who commits sin. It's the person who's manufacturing it, fashioning it, causing it, causing it to occur. Righteousness is whatever activities God is the source of and what is seemed and deemed right by God as a judicial verdict. He who sins is of the devil. Okay, the devil is just the slanderer par excellence. The devil, the false accuser, the unjust, the one who defames another with the goal of severing a relationship. Whoever has been born of God. Okay, so if you're born of God, remember that's the point of regeneration 
at baptism with the Holy Spirit, and then they cannot sin, meaning ruling out as fact, you have no ability. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is going to be tugging on you so hard, you will not be able to continue in this. If you do, you will be resisting the Holy Spirit, and that puts you in a different category, okay? So, if we are saved, why would we ever have any issues if we're unable to sin? Okay, why do we need to even go and, and ask for forgiveness if we're unable to sin? Right? That's what some people think. Well, notice a few things. First, the Christian being spoken to of in 1 John is they are abiding in God's word. That means they are walking in the Holy Spirit. Let's say you're not doing that. Right now is the best time to repair that today. Make sure you're walking in the Spirit, okay? Because that's the only way you're going to have success. The second thing to notice is that um, if you remember in the last video, there was the um, living in the Spirit and living in the flesh, right? If you remember those words that were involved in Romans 8, 1, it says to walk in, to regulate one's life by. Okay, so you're either regulating your life by the Holy Spirit or in the same manner as, or by the flesh. Those are your two choices. You're either gonna go with your animal self, the earthly influence, everything that the world is pressing and saying, this is so important, you have to do this. And everything that they believe, you have to believe that. Or you're trying to do 100% heading towards Christ and holiness and the Holy Spirit. And all you care about is doing whatever God tells you to do. And if it disagrees with the world, so be it. You don't care what the consequences are. If you get fired, if you get an F on a paper, it doesn't matter because you're seeking after Christ, okay? So this is about someone's habitual lifestyle, okay? Looking at First John and understanding the word abides and meaning an extended stay. So if you are abiding in righteousness or abiding in sin, those are two different camps, right? So remember from the last video, the chart, what were the consequences? The basic consequences for the unrighteousness and walking in the flesh is basically you're not going to heaven. And the basic consequences for being in the spirit and for the spiritual behaviors is you're gonna have eternal life, citizenship in heaven, and you're gonna have an easier life, you know, just how you function. So maybe you can see there's a really consistent theme going on here because unrighteousness is self-led and sin is self-empowered. So if you can understand, if you grab your life by the reins, then the spirit is not leading it, then that is sin by definition, okay? So 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we are told to walk by faith and not by sight. Romans 1, 17, um, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And 2 Corinthians 4, 18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for these things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Walking by faith and not by sight brings back that Hebrews 11 concept, which all those remember from the last video, the biblical giants, every time it said they had faith, it also says that they did something. There's an obedience factor to faith right? So if we're in faith, we're listening to the Holy Spirit, we will obey the Holy Spirit, we will obey the Bible, we will obey the characteristics of righteousness which we are called into. The Holy Spirit will never lead us down a path that is going to be um, unrighteous, defiling, none of that. So if you're walking properly, you won't even be You'll never be drug into the the list of things that are, you know, not very pleasant, okay? Now, the problem we run into often is we, we see these people who seem to be Christians on Sunday, but then Monday through Saturday, they live no different than anyone else that's near them in the world that is not saved. So, um, by definition, if you are truly a Christian and you were living like that, you are quenching the spirit. You are not listening to the spirit. If you're going out partying, if you're sleeping around, if you're sleeping with your girlfriend and you're not married, if you are doing drugs, if you are whatever, you are quenching the spirit or you are not saved. There are only two choices on that. Okay. And we are told not to quench the Holy Spirit. It says, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Um, also, we need to mention that it's our human tendency 
to kind of want to morph and be like people around us. That's why people in similar groups always dress alike and talk alike and have the same accents and all of that stuff. That's because it's our human tendency to want to do that. So it's very important that we, with our human tendency, consider who we are with. So if you hang out with Christians all the time and you hang out and you read the Bible and you listen to things that are Christian and you have music that is Christian, you will be more likely to be not falling away from what you should be doing than if you are watching secular movies and reading secular books and surrounded by people that are very pluralistic and secular and pagan, you are going to have a harder time with your Christianity if you're surrounded by all of that. And you're going to want to morph into them instead of morph into Christ. And you're supposed to be around so many Christians that you want to morph into Christ. Of course we need to be around non-Christians or how can we save more people? But for your core people, the people that matter in your life, they better be Christians. If they're not, that's something you need to change right away. The things that make us defiled or fleshly, okay, when we drift into these things like cussing or um, partying or whatever, those things are often because that's what people around us are doing or the movies that we're watching, that's what they're doing, etc. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived by bad company, it corrupts good character. Jesus himself says in Matthew 6, 32 to 34, for after all these things, the Gentiles seek, these are like your daily needs, okay? For your heavenly father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things, sufficient for the day of its own trouble. Now, Paul even does a whole discourse in Romans 7 about how his human nature draws him in to do things he wishes he didn't do. He's acknowledging, I'm not always holy. I wish I was. I'm seeking holiness. I am holy is considered like God sees me as holy but I know that I'm missing the mark sometimes. That's what he's saying in this these set of verses, okay? So God knows, and the authors of the Bible know, that there's no perfection until we get to be glorified, okay? Until we get to heaven, we're not gonna be perfect. We're gonna have these little slip-ups that doesn't change the status of someone who is justified as long as they stop doing it and they feel bad, they feel remorseful, they try to not do it. They're not living their life to try and be like all their friends that aren't Christians, okay? If we notice the words in Galatians, it also shows that some actual Christians will slip into sins. And those are sins of ignorance, okay? Sometimes they're sins of omission, sins you did not do something you should have. And sometimes they're sins of commission, meaning you committed a sin you, you should not have done, okay? These typically are out of ignorance by people who are trying to follow Christ and listen to the Holy Spirit. So um, God has instructions though on how that person is to be brought back. Pay attention, look at this, pretty cool. Um, Romans 7, 9, for the good that I will do, I do not do, but the evil I will not do, that I practice. So this is Paul saying sometimes he slips up. Galatians 6, 1, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, okay, so overtaken is taken by surprise. In any trespass, trespass is any falling away, lapse, a trespass into sin, to do something non-deliberately but wrong, are spiritual, meaning they're saved, restore such a one, restore is to properly adjust so that the pieces can be fit back together properly so that it can be brought to its full destination in good working order after the adjustment, okay? Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. So that means if they slip into sin, other Christians are supposed to come around and say, like, dude, you seriously cannot do that. Look, the Bible says right here. And the Holy Spirit should be convicting them of that. And then you should gently bring them back and say, hey, just hang out with us for a while. And, you know, you can learn a new thing or whatever. Or we'll pray for you or we'll help you. Here, listen to this music instead. Whatever. Give them, you know, some support. But you have to be careful because they're obviously doing something that maybe um, you might be tempted into doing. Because it says, lest you also be tempted. So you have to be careful when you bring people back into the fold that have slipped out, okay? But they can come back in. That's the great part. So, so understand, these are what I like to call baby sins because these people slipped into it. They didn't realize it. They hadn't read that verse yet or they weren't thinking of it in that context. Like, oh, I didn't realize that that meant that, you know? Or it just ha happened upon them. Like 
they did it and they went, oh man. It doesn't affect their justification status at all. It doesn't really matter what those different things are. If a person realizes they sin, or if they slip into a sin and another Christian around them realizes their sin and gently tries to say, hey, guess what? This, uh, this is not a good thing. Um, the Bible tells us what this, um, what the proper response is to these kinds of diversions. So first John one nine, if we confess our sins, he is faithful, faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. James four, seven and eight, therefore submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners and purify your hearts, you double minded. So basically stop doing it and tell the devil to go away. And the more you tell the devil to go away, the easier it'll be not to do it. Um, Ephesians 6, 11 to 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Galatians 6, 7 to 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. For he who sows his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So, how do we do this? This is best done with communion regularly. I know a lot of churches like to do this once a month gig, but that's not what the tradition was in the first century. It was every time they met. Okay. Now this will take a minute, but I'm going to have to go backwards and talk about something in the Old Testament in order to f help you fully understand the communion process. Okay. But first John three, two to nine that says, beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Remember, we talked about that to take upon oneself the purification. In the Greek, it refers to the exact thing that the Nazarites used as a vow to God to be set apart. Okay, so we need to quickly run through what a Nazarite vow is and what that looks like. And um, it's pretty quick. So here we go. The vow and offerings of a Nazarite. A man or a woman can consecrate an offering for the purpose of separating himself or herself to the Lord and take the vow of Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord. The vow is keeping the laws of separation until the days of the vow are completed. All the days of separation will be holy to the Lord. So the rules are no grapes in any form from vine, seed, skin, or fermented, no cutting of the hair, no going near a dead body, even family, nothing unclean, and this was already expected in the general law, nothing unclean, okay? So above the nothing unclean, everything else is on top of that about the grapes in the hair and everything, okay? So here's the actual rules that kind of are broken down. When the days of separation are fulfilled, Okay, so you've promised you're going to be separated for God to be holy. Um, go to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and present the offering to the Lord. So it's one male lamb, one ewe lamb, one ram, one basket of unleavened bread, the cakes mixed with oil, the unleavened wafers, the grain offering, and the drink offering. The priest will bring the offerings to the Lord. Offer He offers the sin and the burnt offerings, that's the lambs. And he offers the peace offering, which is the ram. And then he offers the grain and the drink offering. Well, the grain and the drink offering parallel with communion. Now the Nazarite shaves his head to be consecrated at this point at the door of the tabernacle. And it is put on the fire that is under the peace offering. Priest takes one unleavened cake and one unleavened wafer and puts them on the hands of the Nazarite and the priest waves them as a wave offering before the Lord and the boiled shoulder of the lamb. These, the wave offering, the breast and the thigh of the heave offering are holy and the priest consumes them, okay? Then the Nazarite is considered holy and may drink the wine and regrow his hair. Now, here's the thing with the Nazarite law. If this person became defiled, they came across something unclean against the regular law, or they cut their hair on accident or on purpose, or they went near a dead body or a dead thing, 
okay? Then they were considered defiled. If you think back to that chart we had, we had all the defiled and then we had ungodly and whatever. Defiled was the, the status of, well, some Christians do activities that are defiled or that are in the flesh, right? Even though they should not. But it says in other verses, you cannot do the things that are ungodly. Okay, so defiled, this parallels that God has not changed. He's like, I understand that um, in some situations you might be defiled. Now the definition of defiled in the Old Testament is going to be different than the definition of defiled in the New Testament. But nonetheless, God understands you might become defiled either on accident or you make a bad choice. If you do, there's a way back because here's the Nazarite. He took his vow, but then he became defiled. Here's how he has to come back. Defiled. All the previous days of separation are not counted. So let's say you said, I'm going to be set apart for um, 60 days. And then on the 59th day, um, you're spouse died and you you know took care of your dead spouse you have to start the entire process all over again once you're done with that whole mourning process you'd have to start all over okay you can't change your count you can't be like well now i want it to be 22 days you can't do that defiled all the previous days of separation are not counted if the nazarite becomes voluntarily or involuntarily defiled if the nazarite is defiled by being near a dead person or in order to keep his days of separation he must go through this process in order to begin his days over so this is sort of like a um, cleansing before he can even restart okay so there's the day of defilement then there's the day of cleansing the day of cleansing he needs to shave his head then on the seventh day remember we keep coming back to the seventh and eighth day thing after the seventh day he shaves his head again then on the eighth day he goes to the door of the tabernacle with two turtle doves or two young pigeons then um, the priest will use a bird for the sin offering and a bird for the burnt offering. This will provide atonement or forgiveness for the Nazarite's association with whatever that uncleanness was, okay? In this case, death. Now, when the priest will sanctify his head on that same day, so he's going to put what? Holy oil, the Holy Spirit. So after the seventh day process and then the eighth day, then he gets the Holy Spirit poured on him essentially okay so what happened he wasn't walking in the Holy Spirit now he is <laughs> you see okay then the Nazarite shall consecrate or promise to be set apart okay starts his day count for whatever his commitment was and he goes back to being set apart for God to be holy now we already know that in the new covenant thankfully we are fully atoned for through Christ's blood so we don't have to go through that whole entire process of let's re-kill something okay because jesus is already our sacrifice for sin but what is important is there's a process going on that forgiveness needs to happen and then the the holy spirit needs to be stepped back into for us okay do you see how that's parallel basically when they're starting over and getting this oil poured on their head that's like a re-consecration a re-setting apart okay so Christians can do that too. You can be re-consecrated. You can go to prayer and be like, okay, Lord, I'm just going to start over. Okay. So I don't know what your sins might be, but if you have yourself caught in something that's real bad, you can be like, okay, I need to push the reset button. Lord, I need to re-consecrate. And from this point on, I'm not doing anything else. Okay. There's a story in Judges about Samson and Samson's mother was told by the Lord, by the angel, I think in a dream, that she had to um, be Nazarite for the entire pregnancy and then raise this child in Nazarite tradition the entire time, his entire life, he had to be Nazarite. Um, and so Samson was supposed to be Nazarite the whole time. So he had long hair, which everyone always knows, but I'm going to read you the highlights. Okay. You can go through this at your own pace. But an angel of the Lord appeared. The child should be a Nazarite to God. The Lord blessed him. The spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at times. Um, he married a Philistine. Okay, so he's defiled. He just did something totally against the law. Then the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. He's, the spirit of the Lord still with him, even though he sinned. He ate honey from the carcass of a lion. That was unclean. That's two strikes. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon him again. And he goes and he does what he's supposed to do.
do is killing different people. Then he kills a thousand Philistines with a jawbone, okay? Then God split open a hollow place in two and water came out of it for him to drink. We're talking a Moses moment for this guy, okay? God is all over this guy, okay? God is providing for him left, right, and straight, even though he's making mistakes, okay? He saw a prostitute, uh, not good not good um then he told what he wasn't supposed to tell which is what his secret was which is i can't cut off my hair then of course she you know turns on him for money then it says then his hair grew back okay we can only assume because knowing of the process of the nazarite thing his hair grew back in that time period he was like mm, i made some mistakes lord i'm going to reconsecrate myself whether there was oil or not we don't have any idea, it doesn't say, but the fact is he made a mental choice just like any Christian can do and say, okay, I was off the track. I'm gonna get on the track and from this point on, I'm sticking with it, okay? And God did use him in a mighty way to take down more people from Team S, from the Philistines at his last moments of life than he did all the other times that he was still doing what he was supposed to be doing. So in short, let's just summarize his story. He was set apart before birth to be Nazarite. He was raised holy, but he wasn't always perfect, just like we are not perfect. He had um, God's Holy Spirit on him constantly. He was blessed and gifted. He was a judge for Israel and he knew his Torah best. He was a serious, serious Israelite. He wasn't like, yeah, sort of into it. He, he knew the law. He was a judge. <laughs> then he sinned, and then he sinned some more, and then he sinned some more. And finally, he had an ultimate downturn. But before he died, he repented, and he turned, and he got back on his mission, and he straightened out his life. And that's what every Christian can do. No matter what you've done, you can still turn around and turn to Christ and go, Okay, I'm sorry. I got to push the reset button. I screwed this up. But you could fix it for me, right? Because <laughs> he can, and he will. Because he wants you with him. He loves you. Um, so this reinforces that the Old Testament concepts and the New Testament concepts are identical. Okay? God doesn't change. The methods change. The terminology changes. But his spirit and how he sees us does not change. He wants people who 100% want him. And if you're going to make some mistakes and screw up, he's going to let you go and be like, all right, go see how it is on your own. That's going to stink. But then when you finally come to the end of yourself and you go, I can't do this anymore. I seriously need you. He's going to, okay, I'm still here for you. I got it. Let's go. Okay. It's grace. It's grace in action. The Old Testament, the New Testament, the whole thing consistent. Grace in action. Okay. Now, what are we exactly talking about? Walking in the spirit. Okay, so you have to get to the point where you are done with unrighteousness and all you want and all you desire is to listen to the Holy Spirit and do whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to do. You're going to read your Bible like a crazy man, like around the clock. Whenever you have free time, you're reading your Bible on your phone, in a real book, both. You're going to have to sink yourself into the Christian and righteous behaviors and after a while you just become them. Okay. The faith that God can save creates actions. Those actions have blessings attached to them. So there's grace, freedom from the bondage of sin, meaning it can't make you stay sinning. You can walk away from it. People who are not Christians cannot walk away from it. You can if you're a Christian. Eternal life and the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is how we run life. It's like a neat little circle that just keeps going around. Now, the Holy Spirit is essential because it helps us navigate through the viewpoint of righteousness, holiness, and sanctification. He re regenerates us and renews us, but we must submit to his leadership. Many understand this when they come to Christ. Some do, in fact, believe that Jesus is the Christ and may even appear to be wonderful people, but they have not ever been sanctified, and they do not walk in the Spirit. These are what some people call carnal Christians. I don't call them that because I don't think you can be carnal and a Christian. They're two separate horses going two separate directions. Some have learned the hard way when they come into Christianity that if they do not stay clear of unrighteousness, unrighteous friends and unrighteous activities, they get sucked back into carnal lifestyles. And they either 
resist the Holy Spirit and get a stubborn heart, or the Holy Spirit starts throwing at them things that they were like, ah, oh my gosh, my life's falling apart. Things are terrible. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit is trying to get you to finally submit that you cannot do this and you need the Lord because he's trying to make you realize, hello, you're living wrong. So when your life is going bats and out of control and you're like, what the heck? Uh, that's the heck. You're screwing up. Get your face in front of the Lord. Get your Bible in front of your face. Obviously, the lifestyle thing is very important. It's very um, understandable that people fall into things, especially if they're newer Christians, because what's around them are things that are not righteous, okay? And you can't expect someone who is, you know, fresh off the boat into Christianity to be like, oh yeah, I know how to do all this, okay? So, I, as a person who's been a Christian a really long time, I thought it might be a good idea to just give a couple of tips on if you would like to stay in the light, in a righteous living lifestyle, but you are in habits that are drawing you backwards, okay? These are some tips. First, always is prayer. Pray about it and be like, Lord, please help me to do whatever it is that is in scripture that I'm reading. Help me to be that. Help me to do that. Help me to have your heart. Help me to see with your eyes, okay? Next, prepare in practical ways so you're not blindsided by temptation. Uh, don't go to your girlfriend's house and no one's home and you expect you're not going to sleep together. Don't do it. You know, like get yourself in situations where you're not tempted to make bad choices. Okay. Be aware that when you first change your behavior, it might feel strange. Okay. It might be foreign to you, but that's okay. It's kind of like you fake it until you just turn into it. Okay, so um, you might, instead of swearing, you might say something else that sounds goofy to you. And after a while, you just stop swearing because you no longer need that. Understand that non-Christians do not live under the freedoms or the responsibilities that you live in. So it's not your responsibility to try and judge them for what they're doing. They're under law. You're under grace. You have a different realm. So don't, don't try to compare yourself with them. Just say, I'm different, I'm set apart, I have to live differently, they can do what they do. Doesn't mean you join in on it, you do nothing of it, okay? Um, because their master is a different master than yours. So if you're with those people, you just have to let them do what they're gonna do. You can't sit there judging and be like, well, you shouldn't be doing whatever. That's not gonna help anybody. Um, the more good you do when you are faced with evil, the more good you focus on in scripture and worship, the more you focus on Christ and the, the bonds of the old man will be annihilated. They just start falling away. You don't need them anymore. They just, they lose their power with you and do the things in the Bible. And literally, the more you do it, the easier it is. Rejoice if you are being attacked spiritually because, because Timas will never attack you unless you are threatening to him. Either you're threatening to leave his realm of power or you are threatening by bringing Christ to those who need it. Either way, he doesn't like that. So if you're getting a lot of spiritual attack, you're doing the right thing. We used to hear growing up, oh, well, if these things are happening to you, you're probably sinning. Guess what? No, that's not what that's, not what that's about at all. It's about I'm actually doing the right thing and that's why TMS is trying to kick my hiney. It stinks, but you know what? I've got the power of the Holy Spirit and I don't have to go to hell. So whatever, if it takes some suffering on this side, I don't care. Each time you beat the battle, you grow stronger. So here's some things that you can consider doing if these are problems you have. So if you have problems with cussing or swearing, you can stop listening to secular music, which is filled with profanity. You can stop watching movies that have profanity. Silly alternatives like Mingafoot instead of saying something bad. Or you could use old um, retro things like shucks, you know? You can hold your tongue and smile. Like you wanted to say it, but you didn't. But the more you don't say it, the better you get at that. Um, if you're angry or hurt and that typically would cause you to lash out at someone um, in your mind say Lord deal with them and let it go literally let it go um, forgive 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 stop don't speak think a minute be quick to listen slow to speak slow to get angry oh take the hit let them let them say whatever they want feel the pain and then forgive them because that's what we're called to do we're not called to lash back out and be like well you said whatever 
let it go. <laughs> okay, let's say you're really drawn to the party lifestyle. Drunkenness, riots, partying, sleeping around, all that stuff. Get new friends. Get new friends. That's my first thing for you. Get new friends. Second, uh, remove drugs, alcohol, all that stuff from your presence. Because if you are still tempted by that, you are not over it. If you're not over it, you can't be around it. Um, do not attend. Do not watch movies with. Uh, find new ways to spend your time. Uh, if someone asks you to go, be like, nah, I'm good. Or, nah, I don't want to go anymore. Or, that's not my thing. I'm out of that. Or whatever. Just, just don't go. Um, irritating behaviors that others do that might trigger you. So, they might be prideful or backbiting or... They're like challenging you with like, oh, well, I'm wearing whatever brand, you know, whatever. Okay, so read Proverbs, John, Romans, Psalm 119 over and over and over and over, okay? Because those help you to have a really good perspective on how to deal with people and how to stay faithful, okay? Then when confronted and tempted, remind yourself, that was the old me. I am not going to make a retort. I am not going to, you know, lash back at that person. Take the hit if they're going to try and slam you. Just smile and be like, okay, whatever. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to respond. Um, tell the truth. The truth will rise up from the, and people will know that you told the truth. Okay. Employ the, oh, good for you. But don't compare or compete with them. Smiling and not saying word, it's very effective because you're thinking whatever you're thinking. They have no idea what that is. But you are not retorting. Be loving and forgiving. Answer with kindness. Do not spur others on to jealousy by pointing out things about yourself or your possessions. Okay, sexual sins. These are lewdness, which include dressing and viewing scantily clad people with the aim of arousal, including porn, some R-rated movies, explicit literature for mental images. Fornication, which in our um, day and age is unmarried sex. I know it's a big biblical fancy word, and all. I have so many people that say to me, "Oh, that's okay. It's not in the Bible." Uh, yeah, it's called fornication. <laughs> that's anyone with the same gender. Dishonor with bodies. That's every sexual sin, including care, man. Disgusting stuff. I don't want to think about. Okay, adultery. Sex with anyone, if any one person in the relationship is married, that is adultery, period. So, find new friends. We've already discussed that. Uh, don't put yourself into situations where you can view, see, or experience any of that. Don't support any of it. Don't tell your friends it's okay. I mean, you don't have to sit there and go and try to preach to everyone that's non-Christian and be like, you're going to hell and oh my gosh. But if they say to you specifically, hey, I did whatever and be like, dude, that's not cool. You shouldn't be doing that. That's, that's nasty. That's, that's not good. That's like, go to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. You should not be doing that. I mean, you have to be honest about it, but you don't have to be a jerk about it. You know, um, make firm boundaries and rules so that you cannot be involved in any of those situations. Stay away from the temptations of it. Your heart and mind. Many of the things that are on the list of all those sins are in the circles and the rectangles and all of that. Um, those are things that are within your, your mind or your heart, your desires. I can't list them all here because there's so many of them. But what you need to do is every week take communion. If they don't do it at your church every week, do it at your house in between when they do it at church. Okay? And you need to sit there and think, and evaluate, do I measure up to Jesus as the measuring stick, thanking Jesus for his sacrifice, and then you need to dig into scripture and focus on the lives of David, Jesus' words, and both of those will, will help you to focus on who you should be, okay? Socialize with Christians um, that are more mature than you. You might be a new Christian and all your friends are new Christians, but you need to find the older people. And you need to track them down and be like, I need to figure out how to be like that. Okay? Because they're going to have mastered so many skills that are way outside your wheelhouse at this point. But by being around them, you'll pick it up. Um, wickedness. Now, wickedness is very specific in the Bible if you go in the Greek. So it's idols, idol worship, pagan values and beliefs. It's a very broad category. So this includes things like Feng Shui and the Marvel Universe and Catechism and all the Asian religions, philosophy, New Age, black magic, crystals, evolution, fortune telling, all the clubs like the Illuminati and Masons and all that, you know, stuff. That's wickedness. Okay. Now wickedness, chop down your worship music to a few wholesome songs because there's some companies out there that are putting out stuff that isn't right. 
Um, do not intake books or movies with any of this. You know the whole Harry Potter thing? You should not be reading Harry Potter for any reason at all. And there's other books in the same vein. Do not touch them. Do not go and see a person that reads poems or tells you your future. Um, be mindful of what jewelry you're wearing, what shirts and clothes you're wearing, what images they have on them, because sometimes they're associated strongly with wickedness and you're kind of broadcasting to the world that you're involved in wickedness. Um, so don't do that. Uh, find new interests. If that's what you were into, you need to find new things to do. And they might be weird at first because you're used to whatever this weirdness is. But you need to find new weird stuff that you like that is righteous and that is interesting to you because you need to come fully out of that. This is very abhorrent to the Lord. He hates wickedness. Like, that is a bad, bad, bad one. 1 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We talked about the Nazarite vow and what that process was and how God understands that we're not going to always be perfect. We talked about Samson, who was used fully by the Lord, had the Holy Spirit the whole time, even though he made mistakes, but he did come back and keep his life focused. We talked about what to do, um, how to stay clear of some of these like major areas of um, defilement, just by practically preparing yourself and not being involved, okay? Um, we saw clearly in the very, I think it was the first or second video in this series, that Aaron's sons, when they profaned the sacrifice and they gave offerings to a false idol in God's sanctuary, he was not happy and he turned those people into ashes, right? Just boom, you're gone. So the Lord doesn't take kindly or lightly to this double-minded thing. It to be 100% for him or 100% for Team S, but there's nothing in the middle to him. We've talked about how when if you fall off the wagon and you do something that's a sin and you feel bad about it and you try to come back to the Lord, you have not lost your justified status. You're not going to lose your salvation over that, okay? But what is important is the attitude you come back to the Lord with. So in Jeremiah, Old Testament, 25, 5, they said, Repent now, everyone of his evil ways and his evil doings, and dwell in the land of the Lord that he has given you and your fathers forever and ever. In the New Testament, it says, Acts 3, 19 and 20, Repent, and then turn back so that your sins may be wiped away, and that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and he may send Jesus the Christ who has been appointed to you. So you understand, if you have times of refreshing with the Lord, that means you need to spend time with him. So you repent, but then you need to dig in to the Bible and prayer so that you're focused. Then part of that is this act of reconsecration, okay? You're constantly always wanting to be on the straight and narrow, okay? And at the end of a Nazarite um, commitment, they had that uh, grain and wine offering. And we are to continually take communion, which is to remind us of the grace that was afforded to us through Christ. And when we understand that, we also should feel humility okay okay communion is first corinthians 10 21 you cannot drink of the cup of the lord and the cup of demons you cannot partake of the lord's table and the table of demons that means you have to choose when you come and take communion you have to be like okay i'm done with all the things that i was doing that i did not realize were right or that I was choosing to rebel and be wrong in, okay? But I'm changing now. So you come to communion and that is your point of reconsecration. That's your point of, okay, now I'm starting over. I'm not gonna do it anymore, okay? Gratefully, Jesus set up the Institute of Communion, so we all have good information on this. We've got Luke 22, 17 to 20. He took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he said, and he took the cup after 
the supper saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. First Corinthians 11, 23 to 26 says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night, which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this club, cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Proclaim means to publicly proclaim or announce to make known. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven to 32. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But the man may examine himself and and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may, may not be condemned with the world. So what's it saying? If you come with a wrong heart, you haven't let go of the world and you are not respectful and worshiping when you're having your communion you will become sick weak or asleep so that the Lord can give you swats that's what we call it at our husband you had spankings because those can wake you up to be like oh I think I need him Okay, so let's look at what these words mean. Pretty interesting. Unworthy, irreverently, or unworthy for a thing. We already saw in 1 Corinthians 10 that if you were having the cup of demons at the same time, that's not cool, right? Examine, to test and examine a standard, to scrutinize metals as a testing for purity. You're supposed to examine yourself against the standard, which is Christ, and then be like, hmm. I really screwed up on this. I need to stop doing that. Or this I shouldn't have done. Or, you know, hmm. You need to think about that. And then you need to make a decided choice every single time. That you're going to do better. Judgment. That's damnation. Reason. For this cause. For this reason. For the sake of. Why? What reason? Because they're drinking judgment to themselves then people will be weak, which is feeble, impotent, sick, sluggish in doing right, having no power to promote piety and salvation, destitute of power among men, lacking in discernment regarding what is lawful and unlawful, or sick, which means infirmed, sick, without strength and sickly, and then to sleep, which is to be sleep, to calm or to be sleep or metaphorically caused to die and chasten. We're talking about chastened by the Lord to train children, to cause one to learn by correction with words or molding of the character or by reproof or admonition, which is a firm urging. So what is this? This is what the Holy Spirit does to us. He's like, please don't do this. I'm giving you this funny feeling so you don't do it, right? Okay, be sure not to think that the elements are magical. Now I know there's some believers and they think that these elements, once in your mouth, turn into the body and the blood of Christ. No, no, they don't do that. That's weird. First John 2, 1 to 2. My little children, these things I write you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Jesus is the central focus. And thankfully, he left with us his helper, the Holy Spirit, for us, okay? Jesus is the reason we stay sin-free. He's an advocate. He sits next to God, and he's like, erase that. They didn't, they didn't mean that. I got this. We're going to have the Holy Spirit change their little attitude. Don't worry about it. We got this. So the elements of communion are to help us to be introspective and circumspect. So we're going to look into ourselves, see what we need to change, and we're going to be careful about how we live because we remember the sacrifice of Christ, Okay, that should keep us very grateful. And that time every week should keep us in thinking about his perfection, his love for us, any discrepancies we pray over immediately. And the spirit will bring them to mind. If you consistently have a time period, 
in like a weekly time period when you're thinking of these things the spirit will bring to mind things that you were like oh shouldn't have done that galatians 6 4 and 5 let each one of you examine his own work then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another for each one shall bear his own load okay so to examine oneself the tasks the de deeds the inner intentions or the purposes of an individual okay to examine is to properly try and test to distinguish if a metal can pass if it's good or genuine and then to bear is to carry away or remove so it's our job to take care of our own inner self okay the holy spirit's not going to just do it without us we have to help okay all right, so that's how a Christian continually comes back around. They get convicted, they feel bad, they ask for forgiveness, they do communion regularly, and then they continue to grow and their sins are completely invisible to God. Now, we have other people to cover and this one's gonna be a quickie. We already had the sinner, which he his sins, he just needs to become a Christian to get his sins wiped out. Now we've got the poser. Okay, in our day, this is a common sight. The person says they're a Christian, they, they just live fully in the flesh. I mean, they attend a church, they attend a box that looks like a church. I'm not so sure that all those churches are even worshiping the God I worship, but nonetheless, but they do, you know, they fly certain flags and they have magic and they do all sorts of things in their everyday life that is like deplorable. But they're like, I'm a Christian. And I'm like, quit using my name, that's nasty. You are not, you know. But nonetheless, let's point out and see how we know this person is not a Christian, okay? Titus points us to this. Titus 1.16, to the pure, all things are pure. To the defiled and the unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. We have to look in the Greek and see why. To profess to know God is to publicly declare. These people say they're Christians. They publicly declare it. Then they they say they know God. This particular word know is um, to properly perceive and understand. They're saying, I see what you mean. I, I totally agree with you. This is a bridge between the mental and the spiritual. And they say they know God. But in works, that means their tasks, their everyday things, their inner desires by doing physical tasks. So what they choose to have their passions in, their everydayness, okay? They deny him. What is this? To reject, to disown, to turn one's back upon and to refuse to confess, to refuse to agree with. They do not love God, period, by their actions. Their actions are abominable, which is detestable, revolting and disgusting, disobedient, which is unbelieving, not willing to be persuaded by God, outward disobedience that shows an inward rebellious spirit that is evidence of rejecting what God prefers and disqualified for every good work. Disqualified is counterfeit, counterfeit failing to pass the test unapproved when testing for metals for purity they are shown unapproved unfit okay so this person is a poser they are not a real christian okay and matthew jesus says matthew 15 18 to 20 but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts murders adulteries fornications thefts false witness blasphemies all these things which defile a man but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man so it comes from a man that just means leaving the man coming out of it the things of the heart that is the person's soul character inner self um their moral capacity uh their desire to make decisions and follow those desires it's never used of the like um, actual physical organ of the heart, that word. Okay, then defile is to make unclean, to pollute, to be ceremonially unclean. A thing that is intended to be used as sacred, which is a human. We were created to worship God. So it's intended to be used as sacred, but it's used as common or ordinary. It is not separate or set apart. First John 2, 4. If anyone says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. First John 2, 19. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. 
us, but their departure made it clear that none of them belonged to us. Seeing this truth, no matter how many times the person calls themselves a Christian, they are only posing as Christians. They may have found some nice people to be in the Christian club with, but by definition, they are not a Christian. So if they want to have their sins forgiven, they just act like a sinful person and they have to actually like realize that they're not Christians. And then they have to go through the process of becoming a Christian, just like a sinner. That's easy. Okay, then we've got the traitor. Now the traitor is a little complicated, okay? The traitor is a real Christian, bona fide, 100%. They've had um, the Holy Spirit. They used to walk in the Holy Spirit. They, um, were fully converted, they've been baptized, the whole deal, okay? Now, they were 100% justified in the Spirit, okay? And now there's people who are going to be like, well, if they're justified, then they're going to heaven. Okay, wait wait for it. There's verses. <laughs> um, the main element that all the traders share, because there's different categories of traders, but all the traders share is they refuse to be restored. They refuse to be persuaded back on the path. Okay, that's the thing that they they do. And they choose to live outside of God. Now, Galatians 1, restore is to properly adjust to that, that the pieces can be fit together or properly in order, remember? And that's actually used of um, wheels, like if a wheel falls apart and you're heading off to town and then uh, they're supposed to put it back together so it can reach its destination. The wheel is supposed to be rebuilt, okay? Now, Titus 1.16, it talked about disobedient, right? Unbelieving, not willing do, to be persuaded by God, outward disobedience that shows the inward rebellious heart. So those two verses, that's what this person latches on to. So here's a few categories. There's the angry. So they may have been rolling along fine, everything's going great, and then they have some personal life crisis, okay? Um, death of a loved one, rape of a child, um, their house burnt down, they lost all their money. It doesn't matter what it is, okay? It doesn't really matter. Some trigger, a life crisis happens and they get angry. And they get angry at God or they get angry at the person who did the crime to whoever it is, them or their loved one. And they refuse to give up on this anger. They don't say vengeance is the Lord's and I'll let him deal with it. They say, I'm dealing with it. I'm mad. And they stick their feet in the sand and they're like, I'm not moving. I am ticked. Okay. Now these people, the longer they stay in this, the Holy Spirit's going to be prodding them. You need to forgive. Uh, you shouldn't be mad at God. He is the ruler of the universe. You need to uh, let that thing go. You know, that kind of stuff. The Holy Spirit's going to be prompting them. They're going to stop going to church. They're going to stop listening to the Christian friends. They're so stubbornly angry that they spiral their life into a really bad place. Some of them return evil for evil. They might murder a person because they're so mad about it. Some of them um, just abandon God. They abandon Christianity. Um, their whole thing is they refuse to take whatever life through as um, God can make this okay. God can fix this. They only can see that God did not play the game the way they thought it should be played, and they're mad. Second kind, we've got the people pleaser. The people pleaser, they have friends, jobs. Um, they might be in a seemingly innocent um, social club that turns really creepy after a while. Um, but the, here's the thing, this person, they, at some point in their life, they have to choose, am I going to do the Christian thing, which I know to do, or am I going to go with what the people want? The people that I'm around that I think are important in my life, am I going to submit to what they say, or am I going to do the right thing, even though they're going to cast me out and say, you, whatever, that's so weird, you shouldn't, whatever. Okay, so they have to make a social choice, okay? And they choose to be, to please people over God. And that puts them into a situation where they do uh, like a capital crime or they do something that is horrible. So they might be involved with dark magic. They might do, they might murder. They might have um, extramarital affair. They might, you know, there's lots and lots of different things they could be doing. But the thing is, is once they take their eyes off God and shift it to what their friends care about, then they start spir spiraling down. And then if anyone, if the Lord, if the Holy Spirit 
if um, a sermon, if a Christian person confronts them and says, hey, dude, you shouldn't be doing that, then they get really prideful and they're like, I can do whatever. You can't talk to me and tell me how to live. Da, 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 da. And um, they stay staunchly in their sin. Right. Then we've got the tolerant. So this person is like, you know, the frog in the boiling water. If you drop them in boiling water, they bounce right out. But if you put them in water and you raise the heat slowly, then you can boil them to death, right? This is that person, okay? They gradually um, adopt behaviors of those around them or they gradually are introduced to things and they say, well, that's okay for you. That's okay. And, um, you know, there are people with rainbow flags that um, a lot of Christians are like, well, yeah, it's okay for them. It's not okay for them. Now, should they be held to the same standard we're okay with? No, because they're not even Christians. But is it okay? Should you be approving of it? Absolutely not. So these people, they begin to support things and promote things that are um, intolerable to God. Okay? And God has said repeatedly that if you do the thing or side with the people who do the thing, you're in the same category to him. He's like, I don't like that at all. You're supposed to only like what is holy. And the things that are not holy are supposed to really make you freak out. You're supposed to be like, that is disgusting. Who is thinking of this? Who does this stuff? You're supposed to be that freaked out at all the stuff the world does, all their paganism, all, all that creepy stuff that they do. You're supposed to, you're supposed to look at it and be like, what? Are you kidding me? You're not supposed to look at it like, oh yeah, all my friends do that. It's fine. No, no, it's not fine. <laughs> None of it's fine. In this category is also stuff like yoga, Eastern religion, crystals, all that stuff. It's like a frog in water. The longer a person is kind of around it, that language sounds normal. And those people are very easily um, swayed into churches that are doing false doctrine because they use the same kind of language. Where a person who is straight and narrow with Christ, they hear a sermon out of a wacky church and they're like, that's totally Eastern mysticism. Why are they even saying that? That's You can't say that in a church. And they, they have a, a reaction to it. But if you're so um, dulled by it, you don't even notice. So then we've got the lawful. Now these are people who willfully choose to go back to the Old Testament law and they want to do all the holidays and they want to keep all the laws and they think they're all holy because they're doing it. Um, there's also people who um, are very heavy into the Noahide laws that are going to be coming up in the end times here pretty soon that basically will kill all Christians. But there's a lot of Christian pastors that are supporting it because um, they're not good people probably. If you look into that stuff, that's some scary, scary stuff. Um, the point is Romans talks very heavily about how the fact that if you go under law willfully, you're out because you have grace. Why would you ever go to law again? Law cannot release you from sin eternally. So if you choose to go under law for your justification, then you're choosing death. Um, of all of these cases of men being traitors, okay, there are, um, these people all used to be fully walking in the spirit, okay? But then they gave Satan a foothold for one reason or another. And then in their pride, they stuck with whatever their path was. They wouldn't listen to other people. They wouldn't listen to the Holy Spirit. They wouldn't read the Bible and be like, yeah, that's what that actually means. I shouldn't be doing this. Every one of them chose to go under law because by default, if you're not under grace, you're under law. So it doesn't matter which side of the fence you're on, you have to pick one. You're gonna be under grace or you're gonna be under law. And if you choose to leave grace, you're by default back under law. Now, there's somebody out there saying, oh yeah, 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 but these people were never really saved. There's many verses that are proving this wrong and let me read them to you, okay? Where you see pink, that is a capital crime, meaning God says death penalty, period, end of story, don't care what your former status was. If you see green, this is how to approach God and repair the situation. And if you see teal, this is showing that a real Christian a bona fide, real, justified Christian can be in this position. Galatians 5.18 But you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. 1 Timothy 1.9 Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, and for the unholy and the profane, and the murderers of mothers and manslayers and fornicators, for sodomites and kidnappers and liars and perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, 
according to the glorious of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. Okay, Galatians 5, 4. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempted to be justified by law have fallen from grace. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 3, 17. Therefore, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall all from your own steadfastness being led away with the error of the wicked first timothy 1 6 from which some have strayed having turned aside to idle talk first john 2 3 to 6 and then 14 17 19 and 24 now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments he who says i know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him but whoever keeps his word truly the love of god is perfected in him by this we know that we are in him he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked i have written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning i have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of god abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one they went out from us but they were not of us for if they had been of us they would have continued with us but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us therefore let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. Hebrews 10, 26, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose it would be if he thought worthy who has trampled the son of God underfoot counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace for we know him who says vengeance is mine I will repay says the Lord and again the Lord would judge his people it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God Hebrews 10 38 and 39 now that the just live by faith but if anyone draws back my soul has no pleasure in him but we are not of those who draw back to perdition but those who believe in the saving of the soul james 4 4 adulterers and adulteresses do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with god whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of god or do you not think that scripture says in vain the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously but he gives more grace therefore he says god resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble therefore this is how therefore submit to god resist the devil and he will flee from you draw near to god and he will draw near to you cleanse your hands um, you sinners and purify your hearts you double-minded lament and mourn and weep let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom humble yourselves in the sight of the lord and he will lift you up now, galatians 5 19 to 21 now the works of the flesh are evident which are adultery fornication uncleanness lewdness idolatry sorcery hatred contentions jealousy outbursts of wrath selfish ambition dissents dissensions heresies envy murder drunkenness revelries and the like of which i tell you beforehand just as i told you in times past that who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of god romans 2 5 through 12 but in accordance with your hardness and impotent heart you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation the righteous judgment of god who will render each one to, according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory honor and immortality but those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness indignation and wrath tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the first jew and then also of the greek but glory and honor and peace to everyone who works what is good 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And as many who have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. Hebrews 12, 14 to 17. Pursue peace with all people in holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the glory of grace, lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble. And by this may you may be become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought diligently with tears. Hebrews 6, 4-6, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So obviously there's much to be said. I mean this could be this could be a month long study. It's there's a lot in the Bible. But here's a really quick summary. The capital crimes are blaspheming the Holy Spirit, willfully returning to the law of Moses for justification, willfully living unrighteously, refusing to stop and thus making oneself by default under the law, and teaching false doctrine and, and refusing to stop. Okay, The forgivable crimes are all other crimes. But they have to approach the Lord like this. Humble themselves before God, like it says in James 4. Stop doing the activity. Get back in right standing. So see the um, sinner man or how the justified man gets in right standing. And then walk in the Spirit and be led by the Spirit. Now, I know there's somebody out there that's thinking, well, this just can't be true because the Lord himself said that, you know, there's only one unforgivable sin. Matthew 12, 31 um, and 32. Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven of men, but the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven of men. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven of him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will be not be forgiven of him, either in this age or in the age to come. Mark 3, 28 and 30 says basically the same thing with a little different ending. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven of men and whatever blasphemies they utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. Perhaps the definition of blasphemy is what is unclear when you read that if you think there's a, just one, one thing that's holding you back. Because let's look at what blasphemy means. Slander, which is the unjust and false injury to the good reputation of another, especially with a malicious intent to ruin the reputation of another. Being impious, which is lacking of reverence of God, ungodly, and being apostate. Reproachful, which is shameful, insulting, rude, offensive. Speech that is injurious to divine majesty, the vilification and the act of defaming or speaking ill of something or someone, especially of God, with evil speaking, morally wrong, wicked, harmful, marked by anger or irritation. Railing, which is the criticizing or to find fault, to accuse as the blame for something. To scorn, to openly refute or ignore with hatred. Okay. Okay, so that's the exact thing that I was just talking about. What is more slanderous, impious, reproachful, injurious, evil speaking, railing, scornful than to have the full knowledge of God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, to be led by that and then have all the benefits of it. And then at some point in your life, for whatever reason, to stop, stop listening, to turn your back on God and say, that's not real. I'm going to go back under law and I'm going to live however I want to live. I no longer want that. What is more blasphemous than that? You are calling God a liar to his face. You are saying to the Holy Spirit, I don't believe in what you're telling me and I'm not going to listen to it anymore. And you are flinging assaults. And to me, I can't see that this is, I think that if you're a sinner and you've never known God and you say things that are horrible about God, those would be forgiven. But if you're a Christian and you knew all the greatness of God and then you turn, I don't, I don't see how that 
that's way worse to me than a non-Christian saying it because that's someone who's from within the body of Christ rejecting the body of Christ. That's the way worse. So what's more blasphemous than that? I mean, it implies that grace is not able to save. It implies that the spirit has some fault. He cannot fix whatever the situation is. He cannot fix you. You are not able to be controlled by him, etc., etc. Okay. Um, I do understand that there are people who go through this. Okay. But at some point, they also come back just like Samson and they go, oh, I was really using my time poorly on this earth. And they repent and they come back and the Lord completely blesses them just like Samson. But there are people who never, never, never turn back. They get into a club and they start worshiping pagan idols or they get into magic and they get sucked in really deep and they never turn back. They are not going to be saved. They made a choice. If you die before you turn back, you will not be saved. Period. Because that's like saying the Holy Spirit could not do it. And that's blasphemy. Okay? And you cannot be next to God and in his presence if you are doing all these ungodly, unrighteous things because you are not holy. And if you're not living holy, you cannot be in God's presence. Period. Okay, to add insult to injury, what is most associated with blasphemy? The scribes and the Pharisees who put Jesus to death and the scarlet beast in Revelation um, 13 and 17 with the seven heads and the ten horns that openly blasphemes God. The Antichrist openly blasphemes God. So if you are going to blaspheme God and the Holy Spirit, you are likened to those people because those are the people that are notably, that are elevated for being blasphemous. So, okay, I hope that you get this. This is like such a huge study and I tried to simplify it as much as possible. Basically, non-Christians gotta become Christians. Christians gotta stay on the straight and narrow and keep listening to the Holy Spirit, feel bad and repent. Uh, people who are posing are non-Christians and then the people who willingly walk away even though they still can turn at any point before death, if they willingly walk away and stay that way, they are counted as non-Christians. Okay? So, whew, one more lesson to go. All right, see you next time.